This is Five After the Hour by Les Weinrot. Assemble the players, make ready the script, cue in the music, for the time is five after the hour. Original music is the composition of Sal Stocco, and the orchestra is under the direction of Caesar Petrillo. Good evening, good listeners. This is Les Weinrath. Tonight you are invited on an author's odyssey. Soon you will embark on a voyage perilous and sail through syntax and strike out boldly with pen and ink. Monsters and giants will contest with you and sirens will beckon to you. Your failed craft of fool's cap will shudder and shake for this odyssey will course through turbid and torrential waters. This is a voyage to be sailed with an uncertain chart for the ports of call are not yet designated. Aboard then, onto the author's craft, all the shore that's going ashore, set sail on the author's odyssey. Does this craft go? Fog, fog, so dense. What does he plan to do with us? Just sits there on the writer's bridge and dawdles. He must have a comedy in mind. He always cast me in comedy parts. Two lines, one joke that doesn't quite come off. Comedy? In such a setting? <laughs> Tragedy. Something stark, naked. That's what he has in mind. I remember when I auditioned for him. My boy, he said, a term of affection. My boy, one day I shall write something for the full richness of your voice. One day I shall script a tragedy, a slice of life, raw, ungarnished. And you shall play the leading role. Perhaps this shall be something on the order of outward bound. It has to have a documentary flavor. He never calls me for a broadcast unless there's a documentary stuff in it. First a file drawer opens, then an impersonal voice, that's me. Then the statistics, or the evidence, or something. It's got to have a romantic flavor, or why am I here? Without someone to make love to, without a poem to read, or a love recitative to declaim, I couldn't pay my board bill. Whatever he's got in mind, It'll take a love twist, you'll see. Oh, I have suffered with those that I saw suffer. A brave vessel who had no doubt some noble creature in her, dashed all to pieces. Oh, the cry did knock against my very heart. Poor souls, they perished. Shakespeare, one of his more obscure passages, but fitting, I think, for the setting. Well, fellow mummers, what does the master plan for this hour? Or rather, this five after. Oh, you again. I thought they killed you off this afternoon on the Colonel Darkness serial. I died, it is true, but I died magnificently. Colonel Darkness, I said. Uh, knife sticking in my chest. Colonel Darkness, you have done for Black Bart. My work is stopped, but my black deeds will go on. 
go on to haunt you, to drive you to the grave. Then I gurgled, uh, gagged, gasped, and breathed my last. Ah, it was magnificent. You no doubt all heard it? No. no. Hmm. Such it is to give one's all for art and for yummy smacksies. Tell me, do children really eat that stuff? They have to get the box tops, don't they? Oh, yes, yes. Uh, I hadn't thought of that. Now that you're here, I'm really confused. And so am I. What sort of a play can he have in mind? Ah, so that's the worry. Mm-hmm. Actors with no scripts. Huh? Like wild horses on the mesa. Like trained seals with no rubber balls to toss upon their noses. Like... Like characters in search of a pirandello, if you'll permit an obscurity. You know the guy real well. What do you think? Ah, uh, who really knows a writer? We broke bread together yesterday noon. I treated professional courtesy, you know. Also, it helps keep you in mind. That was farthest from my thoughts. No mercenary eye. We lunched together. And he sighed, as writers do. He sighed and said, notes, notes, notes. You're sure you got the right pronunciation? He was referring to his writer's notebook. You know, I've observed him for many months. He sees something, takes out his notebook. It's labeled Thoughts for Future Shows. And all this time, I thought he got them out of a file. And there I saw him write. What? What did you see? Tell us, tell us. Listen, I had to bend quite forward. And, of course, I dipped my tie in the consomme. It was delicious with delicate noodles Will so you long. please leave out the menu and tell us what the jerk wrote? We're actors. We'd like to know what we're going to do. Patience, child. Patience. These were the words. I remember them well, for I saw myself carrying off the leading role of Ned. All right, so you're the lead. What did he write? Well, at first it looked like Sanskrit. And then I realized that it was upside down. After you got comfortable standing on your head, what did it say? Idea, he wrote. Idea for a comedy mystery series. The detectives are man and wife. Brand new. If you don't count the you-know-what man and Mr. and Mrs. you-know-who. He was thinking of them because the next line read, Twist on a twist. The young couple are mystery story writers, successful detective story novelists. They marry and are at once called upon to solve a crime. Only, instead of proceeding smoothly, they are misled by false clues, bungle the evidence, mangle the facts. The solution is, a stool pigeon squeals of the cops who make the arrest. No wonder he writes sustainers. Ah, oh, but here's the significant thing. His last sentence. Ned and Nedra get idea from actual murder, write mystery book, it's published, public turns it down, not like real life, say critics. Ah, uh, you see, he's a real genius. Besides, he gave me a job tonight. Hey, he's moving there, on the writer's bridge. Hold on to your hats, kids. I feel a comedy mystery coming up. <laughs> oh, morning, darling. Morning, dearest. Must you awaken with all that clutter? Oh, helps clear the brain. Mmm. Come here, my dear. Mm-mm, Ned. So early. So late when you're so lovely. I'll bet you tell that to all the lady novelists. Of course I do. It's on the jackets of all my books, isn't it? Mmm, Ned. Oh, Nedra. Now stop. You're just practicing dialogue for your new book. What are you working on, Angel? The Case of the Missing Miss. Pebbles are said to stop stuttering. Pardon? Well, you said missing miss and stop. The case of the missing what? The missing miss, my noodle noggin. A young woman is on her way to a wedding. A very good family, too. Well, social background, of course. And she's sitting next to her father in the family car driven by old Henderson, the faithful chauffeur. He used to drive a coach and fours. What's a coach and fours? Why not a coach and sixes? Don't be petty, pretty. Hmm, must note that. Anyway, suddenly, her father turns to address her, and she's gone. Vanished. I know. Only the faint aroma of her perfume lingers in the car. Mm -hmm. She's wearing amplitude, the full lysthem scent. Exactly. Her father is desperate. He doesn't know where to turn, so he... Who can that be at this hour? The early bird, small worm. Yes? You, oh, Ned Nettleton. I... <laughs> Pardon me, I am my wife, Nedra. Uh. Uh, say, meh, to the gentleman, dear. Mm. 
She's a pretty dish, if I say so myself, isn't she? Uh, couldn't have turned a neater phrase myself. But I have no time for formalities. Uh, my card. Hmm. Wallington Billingsley Frisbee the third. What does that spell backwards? Well... Uh, never mind. Look here, Mr. Frisbee. This is your bank book. Saves time. This is a matter of life and death. I'm mad for life. Believe in living it to the full. My sentiments exactly. That's why I'm here. My daughter has been abducted from the family car en route to her wedding. Aha. Uh -huh. The case of the missing miss. Huh? Big pardon? Uh, just rehearsing a few sibilants. Go ahead, sir. My daughter has vanished without a trace. All she left behind her was the scent of her perfume. Amplitude? The full lystum scent? No. Buxom. The robustness of youth. I can't stand this stuff myself. It is cloying. Hmm, I must make a note to change the scent in Missing Miss. And you were here to see me, sir, because... Because I'm a fan of yours, Mr. Nettleton. Oh. I've read every book you've ever written. Well. Bribed the publishers, the weekly magazine stopped to give me advanced copies. I know you know your business. Money is no object. Find my daughter, and you may keep my card, uh, my bank book. See what the balance is, sweet. I accept your challenge, Mr. Frisbee. Consider it only a matter of minutes until we solve the case of the missing miss. Well, here we are again, lost in a fog. Just like the author. What happened to the case of the missing miss? Author lost interest. Said he wasn't good at plotting that sort of stuff. Hoist by his own wisecrack, as the saying goes. Which leaves us where? Ah, uh, I saw him pouring through his notebook. Ideas for future shows? Right. He had one note that looked promising. Caption was, Miracle in a modern day. Uh-oh, there I go, back to the impersonal voice that follows the file drawer opening. Oh, no. The rest of the entry read, Let's see. Oh, work out another satiric fairy tale. Take Little Red Riding Hood. Work out twist on twist. What happens after Little Red's father chops off Wolf's head? Old Grandma's certainly indigent and helpless. Work and social significance when Old Grand comes to Little Red's house to live. Establish conflict between two generations. Old Gran must have complex on Little Red. Show psychological direction line. Title it, Miracle in a Modern Day. <laughs> Come on, Red, one more. Can't. Grand's waiting. Grand's waiting. Grand's waiting. Doesn't that old battle axe ever do anything but sit up and wait for you? But she's old. So why doesn't she get some rest? Rest is good for old people. But she feels a responsibility for me. Oh, yeah? After getting you in a jam with that wolf? But she didn't know it was a wolf. She thought the wolf was me. All the more reason for her to keep her big nose out of our affairs. Any old dame that doesn't know the difference between a wolf and a sweet young Jill like you ought to have her head examined. But darling, the publicity. There's been reams and reams of it. And you can hardly go into any home that hasn't got the story around. Illustrated. Publicity. <laughs> and you let a line of malarkey... A, a tired old story like that stand between us. No, please don't. You're making me feel terrible. I'd like to make that old dame feel terrible. I, I wish the wolf had eaten her. Bet you that would have been worse for him than getting his noggin lopped oh, off. Oh, darling, how could you? After all, Gran is the best friend I have. Well, young woman, do you think it's proper and correct for a proper young woman to be sitting out here unattended or... Well, how do you do, young man? Uh, how do you do? I know you'll excuse Little Red, young man. It's time for her to be in bed. Good night. Mm. Night, Red? Red, indeed. In my time, young men at least had the courtesy and manners to address young women by their proper and Christian names. Night, Little Red. Good night. Well, young woman, it seems that the minute I turn my oh, back... Oh, please, Grandmother. He's a nice boy, and I like him. Uh, nice boy, indeed. Strange that I never heard of him in and around the neck of the woods where my cottage is. Uh, speaking of your cottage... When are you moving back there? Oh, so you want to get rid of me. You want to send me back to that miserable hovel where you know I'll suffer from the psychological associations of that terrible experience I had with that wolf. But the wolf is dead, Gran. How can I ever forget it? 
Oh, that long nose, those gaping jaws, that red tongue, those sharp teeth. But, Gran, I'm the one he tried to attack. I'm the one. I suppose you think it's nothing at all to have your nightcap torn off your head and have to flee for your life into a clothes closet. I suppose you think it's just nothing at all to be locked in a clothes closet fearing for your very life. I suppose, as a consequence, it's nothing to suffer constantly from claustrophobia. I know, Gran. I know. I'm deeply sympathetic. Yet you'd turn me out of my son's house. You'd send me back to the woods knowing how my hay fever acts up there in the fall. Oh, but Gran, well, you could have your cottage air-conditioned, and you'd be free of worrying about me. But what else is a grandmother to do? A grandmother can't worry about a grandchild. What else can she do? What else has she to live for? Oh, but Granny, I know how to take care of myself. And I know how to take care of these modern-day wolves, too. Wolves? Don't say that word, child. I'm sorry, Granny. Won't you consider moving back to the cottage? I feel it's my duty to stay here and guard you against everyone. Then this is your final word? My mind is made up. It's my duty. What are you doing, Little Red? Just looking for something to convince you, Granny. Ah, here we are. What are you... Uh, uh, little Red, that, that's an axe. The same axe my son, your father, used to kill the wolf. Yes, Granny. And I'm going to rectify Daddy's error. My, what a long neck you've got, Granny. Well, whacked her head off, eh? Poetic justice, I'd say. What happened next? Did they try her? Was a true bill voted by the grand jury? The writer got tired of it. Said he'd had his fun, that both Little Red and her grandmother were dopes for being duped by the wolf and that whatever happened was okay by him. He told me he was on the wolf's side all the time. Muttered something about law of survival. Well, I'm getting sick and tired of sitting around this moist studio. What goes next? I get it from the inside that he's intrigued with doing a dramatic narrative, a recitative. Ah, been listening to Wells. I tell you, that guy... We know, we know. You're the poor man's orson. Only nobody will give you a break. Oh, don't be too sure. I saw the latest entry in his notebook. The title was Man or Mouse Divided Against Itself. And it read... Use dramatic recitative with sound effects and incidental voices. Star hammy sounding actor. I am full-bodied and fully mature. I am different from the beasts of the forests and the fish of the sea because I have a soul. I am your soul. True, you have me, and true, you recognize that you have me. But do you truly have me? What is true having? I am a man in a modern world, a world of dynamos and whirling machines, a world of atoms. And the splitting of atoms, a big world, whirling world, world shrunk and shriveled, a world made small by modern men with wings. Consider the mouse. Look upon his small gray being. Note his furtive stealth. Mouse man world, mouse hole, what does it all mean? Seek not the meaning elsewhere, for it is within you. Seek within yourself, and you shall know. I, I am man. I am alone in the world. I wait for you. I am woman. Waiting, rushing, pausing, pushing. What does it mean? What does everything mean?
just when I had my teeth in a good fat pot. Why, the ingrate. Well, why did he cut it off? Couldn't think of an answer. Told me confidentially mice are smarter than men. They stick to cheese. He's very fond of cheese. I shan't make the obvious comment. Well, do we just sit here and mope while that jerk keeps making notes? All writers are quite mad. I know. I once wrote. Let's go get coffee. And really give him a going over. Being an actor is bad enough, but why anyone, in their right mind or out, would willingly and willfully become an author, I don't know. There he sits at his desk, the fool scap surrounding him. The fool. Words piled up in neat little piles. Drawer two for convenient cliches. A reference book with synonyms and antonyms and the first rules of the syntax. Behold him, writer of radio, blatherskite of the killer cycles, ethereal town crier paid to chant his staling stanzas. Come, my fellow followers of Thespis, let us leave him in the welter of his despair. Lo, <laughs> it has come his personal judgment day. He cannot conclude his script. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, you've been on an author's odyssey and now, drenched with the spray of vagrant thoughts, buffeted about by the waves of philosophical indecision, bruised by the blows of scrivening duplicity, I return you to the norm of radio listening. Thank you, and good night. <laughs> Author's Odyssey was written, directed, and produced by Les Weinrod. Heard on tonight's program were Sherman Marks, Joan Lundeen, Mark Perkins, Peg Hillius, Adrian Moore, and Charles Shepard. Original music was the composition of Sal Stocco, and the orchestra was under the direction of Caesar Petrillo. Between now and Christmas, the Army and Navy Postal Service face the greatest delivery problem since the war began. Redeployment of men and supplies means millions of address changes and, in many cases, greater distances to be covered. To make sure that your Christmas package to your serviceman reaches him on time and in good shape, mail it today. Wrap it securely, address it properly, having first selected wisely. And remember, if you want to make sure your serviceman receives his gift from you, mail it before October 15th. To ensure a Merry Christmas for him, make sure that you take steps to secure, wrap properly, address correctly, and send out your gifts today. <laughs> Invited to return to this spot on the dial at the same time next Wednesday night when, from the studios of WBBM, the Wrigley Building, Chicago, we will again bring you Five After the Hour by Les Weinrock. Ken Nordine speaking. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.